S2, so you, you, you have to have it all. <laughs> no, I thought I always had the perfect face for radio, but there it is. <laughs> but it all right. works. We're uh, live on Facebook if you want to get rolling. Okay. <laughs> uh, time to stop hitting on Mar Martin. We can uh, get, get started. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, everybody. In we're ready to go, Mike. Um, yeah, we're good. Yeah, we're, good. we're good. live. Okay, good morning, everybody. It is again Friday, August the 4th. This is a month of two full moons, by the way. It's kind of an exception. Um, the slaughterhouse of failure, of course, is not in our destiny. We shall persevere until we, pers until we succeed. So last week, Dan and I were talking about how to stay poor forever. And the best way is to do everything wrong. According, go, you know, do what other people should, just do what you should not be doing. So we touched on a few of them, and I'd like to just, we'd like to discover one or two of these. And for example, one of them was um, blame other people. And this is something that obviously is, is something we often do. But Dan and I were talking this week. The lady that cleans, that does my house cleaning, she has a, she's a, an immigrant, obviously. She's got a son who's 13. And she's got a daughter who's handicapped. She's missing an arm. And this 13-year-old kid, 13, is got a program on... On, uh, on his LinkedIn, not LinkedIn, on um, Instagram and Facebook and so on, and a, and a website, and he's branding his own clothes. He started th at 13, understanding exactly what he wants. He wants to brand his clothes. He's got a brand, and he his mom helps him patch the whatever the thing is that they stick on these clothes. And he said, and he sells um, sells clothes, and he's got his own brand. And one of the things that really impressed me was the fact that at thirteen, somebody would know exactly what they want. Furthermore, he wants to make money to buy a truck so he can make deliveries of his products. He's only thirteen, and he's so focused on what he wants that his mom cleans offices and he goes to clean offices with her until midnight or one o'clock in the morning and gets paid by the room so that he can help support his mom. And I just wanted to say that is where we look at grit and we look at, at real desire to go forward. We look at, at you know, how we, we can admire and, and we are witnesses to people who can do things. This kid is he's, an, he's 13 years old. I mean, when I was 13, my goodness, I'm damn sure I wasn't thinking anything like that. Dan? Well, you know, children are a little bit different than us as adults because we've experienced a lot of these things. And, and that kind of can make us jaded, right? So we can be jaded because we failed. We've been, we can be jaded because you know, we've learned to blame our circumstances and other people. We've learned to make excuses. We've learned to blame other people, you know, and that that is in our own mind. And we can, the great thing about that is we can change our mindset. And that's why these Friday calls are important. Whether you need it or you don't on a daily basis, you know, we're still here to try and kind of try and help you get your mind right every single Friday. And, it, you know, you want to surround yourself with people that are just as good or, or better than you. And if you guys haven't noticed, Lawrence and I, you know, we work really well on these calls because I do the play by play and Lawrence does the color commentary. He's got all these interesting stories for everything we talk about. You know, he's got a lot more, a lot more experience than I do. Um, and, you know, we, we need to take some of these things, you know, we need to go back and think about ourselves as children before we had it drilled into us that we need to fear things that we it's okay to blame things on other people. It's okay to blame our circumstances because that's all learned behavior. We didn't come out of the womb blaming people for some, for anything. We didn't come out of the womb fearing failure. 
you know, so we need to go back to that earlier time and think about, you know, what if, what if we didn't have these fears? What if we didn't learn these behaviors because of our environment? Um, you know, it's, it's nature versus nurture, right? How are you nurtured? Because nature doesn't tell you to be, to fear things. Nature doesn't tell you to blame other people for things. Nature doesn't tell you to blame your experiences. Nurture does that, right? And, and we're taught that by our parents, or we're taught that by friends, or we're taught that by acquaintances, you know, or we're taught that by TV, you know, that we should fear these things. And it's, that's really at the crux of things. What stifles most people's growth and most people's success is the fear of failure, the fear of what people are going to think. You know, there's so many fears out there that we need to get past that and learn how to get past that and, and come up with a plan on how to get past that. You know, last week we started talking about this, you know, how to stay poor forever. And we're not just talking about financially. We're talking about mentally, physically, you know, all of these different things, because these all tie in together. Right. And, you know, one of the things that a lot of people get um, tied up in is they think the world is fair. And unfortunately, the world is not fair. Um, we all grew up differently. We all grew up with different circumstances. We all grow up and have the opportunity for different education for this, that, the other thing. And, you know, that's just another cycle of, you know, blaming people and coming up for with um, excuses for why you're not doing what you're doing or why you're not successful, right? You just say, oh, well, the world isn't fair, you know, and you complain and, and you know, you, you, you get into this cycle of complaining about things. Have you ever met anybody who every time you talk to them, they're complaining about something? I have a brother that stops by here every day. And every day he complains about something. And I, 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 you know, I'll be sitting out on the front porch and he'll show up and I'm like, oh my God, here it comes again. And I'll listen to him for five minutes and I'll start slowly walking to his car so that he knows it's time to leave. By the time I hit his door, he's getting in his car and he's leaving. Um, because I don't want to be surrounded by somebody who is complaining all the time. And I can't for my own um, my own well-being. And so, you know, be careful who you're surrounding yourselves with, you know, beside, be, um, besides my better judgment, I've surrounded myself with Lawrence and we do these calls together, um, <laughs> but it works. Um, so Lawrence, I, I've said enough. <laughs> so a couple of things, fear of failure. This is something we are taught to fear failure. We're taught from when we are kids, we're, we're, we're encouraged to succeed and we're taught that, man, if you fail, you're going to be in the dog box. Man, if you fail, you're going to, you know, you drop out of college, you're going to fail. If you don't do this, you're going to fail. And we're taught to fear failure. Whereas in our case, what I believe is that we should embrace failure because it's the best lessons we can have. They are the best lessons. We shouldn't fear failure. We should embrace it. I'm going to do this. If I fail, I'm going to learn. I'm going to get up and I'm going to start again. And I'm going to fix it. I'm going to learn from what I've learned. I'm not going to fear it. But that's a common thing that we have in life, all, of, every, all over the world. People, we're inculcated into fearing failure. And then we go through life with temerity. We go through life wondering, oh, my God, I can't do that. I wonder, if, what if I fail? We don't think about what if I succeed? What if I succeed? Not what if I fail. It's just a mindset. But we're taught to, to fear failure from the beginning. Let's get out of that. Let's embrace failure. I'm looking forward to it. We, there's a book about go for no. You know, go for no. What does that mean? It means out of 30 people you speak to, you know, 25 will tell you no. Well, what are you going to do? You're going to quit? No, learn from that. Become a psychologist. Understand why they said no. What is it that's, that's making people not accept your point of view? You may be wrong, but then let them prove it. And this is, this is the ego thing. It's another point we're going to come to. But the other thing about the world being fair, you know, again, we're, talk, we, we, we're also kind of inculcated into that when we're kids. And depending where we come from, because if we come from a privileged society where we are generally in the US, 
oh, the world is fair. But if you come from a society where, there's, where people have nothing, the world isn't so fair. And you've really got to have the grit and get up and go and get it. Whereas having you know, this subconscious thought that the world is fair, then we have this entitlement feeling. A lot of the kids today you know, feel entitled because you know, this is what they got and I'm entitled to this and that and the next thing. The world is fair. That's not. Get off your butt. The world is not fair. And you've got to understand what it is you want. So um, the other thing is, which you said, Dan, was, you know, surround, be, be, surround yourself with, with birds of a feather flock together. So don't look for the woe is me society because they're all going to be bitching about something that's worse than the other one. Oh, my, you know, my wife ran off with, with the, with the maintenance man. Oh, you think that's bad? Huh. Well, my husband, and it just goes worse and worse and worse. And everybody's got a worse story. A woe is me. That's a whole, a whole society of, of negative people. Um, so the, 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 uh, the other thing I wanted to also touch on with this was we talk about our comfort zone. And again, I, I saw something that I thought was very interesting. And we were, Dan and I were just discussing briefly this morning about this. There's, if you draw a circle, and in this circle, you put everything you've got, everything you have, your house, your home, your family, your kids, your cars, your, your bicycle to do mountain tracking, whatever you got, put it in the circle. That becomes your comfort zone. And then outside the circle, put things you don't have. What is it you don't have that you want? That becomes your, your, that becomes your zone of discomfort because you're going to have to get out of your comfort zone to get what you want that is not in your comfort zone. And that's where we've got to also look at. what, And that's where we come to all the same thing. What do you want? Are you comfortable in your comfort zone of mediocrity? Is it mediocrity? And that the comfort zone is not just money. You know, we're looking at what exactly is wealth. You know, in Colombia, they've got a saying that somebody is a pitillo. A pitillo means a plastic straw. And he's hollow on the inside. So it's what you see on the outside is, is something, but what the inside is empty. And that's how many of us go through life. Many of us have a lot of money, maybe, but we're completely morally bankrupt. So, you know, wealth, what is it? Is it money? Is it knowledge? Is it, is it empathy that we can impart, getting rid of our ego? These are things we've got to think about. And in this business, we are, we can, it can allow us to to reach levels that we can afford to think about because we, can, we, we have the time to do it. We're, an inter, we're entrepreneurs. We're not on that treadmill of a nine to five and we have to produce something for somebody else. We produce it for ourselves. Yeah, there's so many people out there um, that are afraid of discomfort, right? Everything they do every single day is meant to keep them comfortable. You know, they take the same way to work. They go to the same restaurants. They stay married to somebody even though it's not a healthy relationship because the discomfort of doing something different outweighs, for them, it outweighs the comfort of keeping things the same. And you're never gonna grow if you stay in that comfort zone. You need to constantly be challenging yourself. You need to constantly be challenging others. You know, every day I try to do something that challenges me or is something that is scary or outside of my comfort zone, you know, and and when you surround yourself with people like that, those opportunities arise more often than not. But when you tolerate mediocrity and you surround yourself with mediocrity, mediocrity, those those challenges those opportunities come less and less. And Lauren said a lot there, and there's a few things that I want to touch on. You know, one of them is um, 
prioritize looking rich over being rich. What is being rich to you? Is that um, having your health? Is that having wealth? Is that having relationships? You know, what does that exactly mean for you? There's a lot of people that don't even know what their definition of rich is. Most people, it's money. And living here in Hershey, I can tell you that that's priority number one for most people because it's a very, um, our town is very, uh, it's a very important to them to keep up the appearances. And there's a lot of people that buy a million dollar house, a million and a half dollar house, and you drive by and half of their rooms are empty. They can't even afford to furnish their rooms to live comfortably. And they drive around $100,000 cars and they're probably living paycheck to paycheck, even though their husband's a physician or the wife is a physician. You know, it's all meant to mask what truly makes them happy. They think money's going to make them happy. It doesn't. So then they go out and search, search for other things. They start, start searching for, you know, maybe this big car is going to make me happy. Maybe joining the country club is going to make me happy. You know, and what they find out if they really take a look at things is that none of those things truly make them happy. It may make them happy in the short term, but the long term, it doesn't. So you need to focus on those things that are truly going to make you happy. Things that um, experiences with your children, experiences with your spouse, experiences with your family. Um, you know, doing things that you enjoy doing rather than, you know, choosing a, a job where everything is dictated to you. You have to work nine to five. You have to fill out um, sales reports. Um, you have to talk with your manager every once in a while. You have to have a ride along with your manager once a month, whatever that may be, you know, and setting yourself up for the life that you want to live. That's what's going to truly make you rich and make you happy. Um, moving on from there, I love, I love this one. It's do your best rather than do whatever it takes. You know, how many of you, you know, me included, you know, I've said at times in my life, well, I'm doing my best. Sometimes your best isn't good enough. You have to be willing to do whatever it takes to reach your goals. If you're willing to compromise and say, I'm willing to do this, but I'm not willing to do that. I'm not willing to sacrifice this, but I'm not willing to sacrifice that. Then you're not doing whatever it takes. You're not doing everything in your power to get what you want, to be successful, to reach your goals, whatever it may be for you, you know, to, to be rich and whatever that means for you. You need to be willing to do whatever it takes within moral and ethical um, definitions to, to get what you want. If you're, if you're not willing to sacrifice one thing for another, more than likely you're not going to, to reach the goals that you've set for yourself. So, you know, when we say whatever it takes, this is something that we also need to commit to. And often it's a dialogue with our families and our spouses and our significant others and everybody else. Because if we're going to go beyond, beyond better and beyond, we've got to also inform and communicate our spouses and our families because there are going to be times when we're going to be working 16 hours a day 18 hours a day we're going to be away from home for doing some things and if the family is if the, if you have good communication with the family then everybody's on board and we've also got a common goal what is it that we want what is it that we all want you know and and we want we want to be able to, Dan, for example, has completely uh, modified his life in the last five years from what he was doing in the operating room 24 seven on call. He was in a, in a room for 24 seven out for 27 years. So now he's going to do whatever it takes to, to, have a family harmony relationship with kids that he has now instantly already there, you know, already grown because he married Kate, but he's already got a perfect family that's done for him because he missed out on those years because he was too busy. Now he's going to go above and beyond and do whatever it takes, which he's doing to be a perfect dad. And that's not just doing the best. He's going beyond doing whatever it takes. So 
you know, the going beyond, doing whatever it takes is, is a commitment to, to doing something that is not only for, for oneself, but for the family as well, because they all have to be involved. I started my career, my work career, delivering newspapers when I was about 11 years old. My uh, soon-to-be brother-in-law had a Pinto wagon at the time, and we would put the tailgate up, and I would put all my newspapers in there on days when it was rainy or snowy, and I would ride in the back of that and throw the newspapers out um, to each property that had a subscription. I then got a job as a butcher's assistant in a local grocery store, and I did that for a couple of years um, until I found a job making kayaks, fiberglass and plastic kayaks and uh, canoes um, custom. Um, people would come in and we'd fit them for, for a custom kayak or a canoe. And I did that for a couple of years, and I actually ran at 18 and 19 18, 19, and 20, I actually ran that company. It was a multi-million dollar company. I ran that company. I had people working for me. And this was while I was in college and high school. Um, I had people working for me uh, that were twice my age. Um, and I was managing them. And I was, you know, at the time I was making, I think I was making $18 an hour back in the late 80s, early 90s, which back then was a lot of money. Um, and then I went to college and I, I, I kind of worked there um, while I was going through college, when I got out of college, I started a construction company with some of my brothers. Um, and I did that for a few years and did whatever it took to be successful in that. And we were successful, but I soon figured out that, you know, carrying 50 pound bundles of shingles up a two story ladder to a roof and carrying um, multiple sheets of plywood all day wasn't going to be the best thing for my body. And when we were doing a, um, an addition for a, a person, a uh, client that it turned out had a medical device distributorship, he asked me if I would help them full time. And in between owning my own company uh, with, with my brothers and um, working for him part time, and you know, I was willing to do whatever it took to make that happen so that I didn't destroy my body for the rest of my life doing construction. Um, and within a year, I was able to leave, um, sell my share of the company to my brothers um, and do medical device full time uh, because I had built a business to about a million and a half. Um, this is in the mid, mid to late 90s, and um, which was a significant amount of business back then. Um, but I was always willing to do whatever it took to, to stand out from everybody else, to be successful, work harder, not necessarily meaning more hours, but work smarter and be able to outwork everybody else just by being more efficient um, with my time. And so we need to learn all, all of these different skills. You know, it doesn't, you know, there's a lot of people that pride themselves on working, you know, 14, 15 hours a day. But if you can get what you need to get done in two or three focused hours a day, why would you want to work 15, 16 hours a day? Um, and, and so, you know, when you're saying you're going to do something, you need to then do it. And most, you know, that goes for when you tell other people, when you make a promise to somebody else, you don't break those promises. When you make a promise to yourself, you certainly don't break those promises. And why would you? Because you're only um, hurting yourself. And when you're, when you do that to others, you're hurting others, obviously. Um, but we need to, to really learn to do a, whatever it takes, not just do our best. And if our best isn't good enough, Work with people on your team who strengthen you or strengthen your conversations with whoever you're talking to about our business. And we need to, we don't want to forget that, you know, sometimes, you know, Lawrence and I talk about this all the time. You know, sometimes you say something to your kids and it goes in one ear and out the other. It doesn't matter what age they are, they just don't want to listen to you because they're your father or, you know, whatever. Sometimes they need to hear it from somebody else. And so the same thing is with this business. When we're doing three-way calls, you can't go out and do this on your own. You need to bring somebody else in because sometimes what, what you're saying to a physician or to a medical device rep is going in one ear and out the other because you're not presenting it in a way that they, they're listening. So you need to bring somebody else into the fold who may connect with that person, right? And if that doesn't person doesn't connect, then see if you can get somebody else. 
So you mentioned, Dan, you know, whatever it takes, going back to the sec that for a second. Um, you know, I don't really like to tell too many of my own stories, but when I was in my 20s, um, they, anyway, they told me that I was not going to be, uh, I couldn't be employed in Virginia because uh, I was, I'm talking a long time ago, for whatever reasons, I wasn't the, the right fit. So anyway, I was sent to Philippines with a whole bunch of rookies to go and learn about the business. We were all trainees. We were sent to the Philippines. And, you know, the Philippines in their 20s, wow. And I decided that I was going to do something different. All the people that I went with, all young guys, they all went and, you know, they'd go and they'd do the eight-hour shift in a factory learning about the tobacco, which was what I was in. Um, eight-hour shifts and uh, dusty, hot, um, just noisy, horrible place. Eight hours. Then they'd go and play golf and they'd go off to the, see the, you know, have drinks and see the girls and everything. And I did two eight-hour shifts every day except Sunday for eight months. Nobody asked me to do it. Nobody told me to do it. And after eight months, the company in, in headquarters in Virginia, the, the president called me. He said, come over there. So I went to Virginia and he said, who are you? I said, why? He said, why the hell are you doing this? I said, because I want to show you and everybody else that I am exceptional. I'm not like everybody else. And he said, my God, I th we thought we'd last, you know, three weeks doing that, but eight months. From there, I became the number two director of a company of 600 employees in Thailand. And it was because I was able to go beyond and do something exceptional that was not just my best. It was way more than that. Hell of a sacrifice. I mean, imagine. But the results, the rewards were there. But there was a motivation for that too. We've also got to think about the motivations about things. So that it's everything that happens is something. There's a motivation for it. There's an action and there's a result. So, you know, we, we, we keep that in mind too in our business on what we're doing the motivation for which we're doing it, how we're doing this. And what Dan just said also, you know, get somebody to talk to us. For example, we, we think we're doing the right thing. We think we're doing great. But we need somebody to be able to talk to us, as, I, as we say in Spanish, to talk to us without trousers on. It means without having any taboos, you know. And that is what? Well, I think that you're saying this and I think you're, I think you're wrong. I think this is not the way to do it. We've got to have somebody to give us feedback, honest feedback, to tell us what we're doing well and what we're not doing well. Otherwise, we ramble through life and all the yes men will come along and we'll be surrounded by people who say yes, yes, every time we say something. We may be wrong, but we need somebody with the courage to stand up or the friendship to stand up and say, listen, buddy, you're way off course on this. And that's what will help us improve too. When we are surrounded by surround ourselves with people who are honest to be able to tell us, and we've got to do the same. We've got to be able to, to, to be constructively um, analytical about who we are surrounding ourselves with, because it's our team in this case. We've got to have a strong team and not be afraid of saying, listen, this, I think you're wrong on this. Good, tell me how we can fix it. Absolutely. Well, it's 10 o'clock. We have a bunch more things we could talk about. We'll extend it into next week. And then we're gonna get it the following week, we're gonna get into the Eisenhower matrix, which I think is gonna be fascinating for all everybody. And you know, it's about prioritizing and focusing on the right things um, in your daily activities. So do we have any questions or comments? One yes. one comment, um, and you circled right back to this with Lawrence's last statement. You're talking about complaining in the beginning and listening to other people complain. And Lawrence's last thing is, you, if I do something wrong, tell me how to fix it. Constructive criticism, 
winners accept that. Winners accept constructive criticism. Good job, guys. Fantastic call. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was a great call. I, I would make one observation, Lawrence, um, which is this. Please don't be reluctant in this particular group to express to us the experiences you've had. It is those experiences which have made you the extraordinary individual that you are. And we can all learn from those. So please do continue sharing those with us. They're extraordinarily valuable for everybody. Martin, you hit it right on the head. I was going to call Lawrence after the call and tell him that same thing. Yeah, yeah I was too, but I thought I would share it in yeah. public. So that the peer pressure is such that he has to share more of these extraordinary experiences. Lawrence, you, you were kind enough and I felt privileged enough to be able to read um, some draft chapters of a book and they're beyond remarkable. The experiences you've had, the, the losses, the wins, the, they're incredible life lessons. Just one of them would be an extraordinary life lesson, but the aggregate of them has produced this extraordinary individual whom I, I greatly admire. Wow. I'm yeah. very hey, uh, if, Lauren, I, if I could just make one quick comment on that. I'm sorry, Jim. Yeah, no, go ahead. Um, a, a, a few years, you know, put pen to paper. If, if you want to leave a legacy for your loved ones, for your family, put pen to paper and write down your experiences, just like Lawrence is doing. Two years ago for my mother's birthday, I gave her um, uh, a gift called StoryWorth. And it is a... Uh, service that you can sign up for. You can add questions in that you would like your parent or your children or whoever you want to give this gift to, to understand more about their life. Um, it comes with questions. You can add questions, you can delete questions, but what it does is it allows them to write a history of their life. And I have gotten to know my mom more in the last two years than I had in my previous 50 years because I gave her this gift. And she's written down all of these things that I didn't know about her childhood, about her upbringing and, and all of these wonderful things. So, you know, if you if you're older on this call and you want to leave something great to your children, to your family, think about doing that. It's, I think it's ninety nine dollars or something for a year. And you can put pen to paper and, and leave something special for your family. And, you know, if, you, if you're younger, give that to a gift to your to your parents and. Um, I think you'll be really, really amazed at how well you get to know know somebody. Jim, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I, I was just um, going to agree with Mike and Lawrence and that about Lawrence. You know, not Lawrence. I'm sorry, Martin. But um, Lawrence has has mentioned this experience in the Philippines a week or a couple of weeks ago, and um, it it hit me with the same effect, and that is. If we just considered the possibility of making the kind of commitment that Lawrence made for eight months, we, with this business, with this business platform, we could literally change our lives, literally change our lives. I think the Philippines was an enormous, uh, you know, uh, springboard for Lawrence, led him into other things that were not going to be available to him if he had not made that commitment. And there's a lot to say about that. If, if you don't make the commitment, what's not going to be available to you? You know, maybe ask yourself that. But uh, so, yeah, I agree. I think Lawrence sharing that particular experience is really good. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everybody. I'm humbled. Thanks, Martin, for your words. And, and, and Mike and everybody, thank you. So uh, it's 11.05, 10 10.05 Eastern time. Thanks, everybody. Anybody got anything else you want to add? Not about me, but about anything else? I just want to say thanks, guys, for creating a safe space for sharing um, our wins and our learns. And, you know, Lawrence, we come for you, but we're really safe for Dan. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that's great. I appreciate everybody. <laughs> Have a fan freaking fantastic Friday, guys. Thank you. Blessings to you. Bye bye. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye now. Uh, Bye now. Monday. Thanks, guys. Have a great day. Bye-bye.